<clears throat> time of 6.30 is here. Time for the meeting to start. And I would uh, just say welcome <clears throat> to the April 10th, 2013 meeting of the City of Lake Forest Plan Commission. I am uh, Michael Lay, Chairman of the Commission. And at this time, I'd like to introduce uh, the members of the Commission who are here this evening. At my far right, uh, Commissioner Ziccarelli. Next to him is uh, <clears throat> Commissioner Karras. And to my immediate right is uh, Commissioner Culbertson. <clears throat> uh, from city staff, uh, we have uh, Ms. Zerniak here tonight. <clears throat> and uh, looking at the agenda, our first uh, item of uh, business is approval of the minutes. Uh, since uh, they're still in process, we won't have any of those to, uh, <clears throat> to take action upon uh, at this time. Our first item of business is, uh, <clears throat> so the next item on our agenda is, is consideration of item number three, a public hearing and action and reconsideration at the direction of the city council uh, of amendments to the zoning code pertaining to fences in ravines and in bluffs. And at this time, uh, I would like, first of all, let me ask, does any members of the commission have any ex-party contacts or conflicts of interest on this first matter? Seeing none, we can proceed. <clears throat> Thank you, Chairman Lay, members <clears throat> of the commission. Uh, this matter, uh, consideration of an amendment to the code to prohibit fences in ravines and on bluffs was before the commission in January. Uh, at that time, you did hear public testimony, and you forwarded a recommendation to the City Council in support of specific language um, to amend the code with respect to that matter. Um, just a bit of background. Um, the city staff has always worked carefully with owners of properties on ravines and in bluffs, and um, have really worked to try and balance the interest in privacy, uh, security, community character, preservation of the ravine, vegetation, um, protection of stormwater flows. Um, but based on concerns the council heard uh, in the last six months of 2012, the council did direct the plan commission to consider an amendment to the code <coughs> to put some specific language into the code with respect to fences in ravines and on bluffs. That was the, um, the genesis of this amendment. <clears throat> when this matter went before the City Council, uh, they were supportive of protecting ravines and protecting bluffs, particularly in light of some instances in recent years of severe erosion on ravines, uh, some severe sloughing on, on bluffs, recognizing that there's constant change in those areas and that really minimizing activity, uh, particularly excavation or any kind of a um, uh, impediment to drainage flows was really important. They stated support for an amendment that addressed fences in ravines and on bluffs. They did uh, generally raise one concern and then uh, an additional concern was raised by one alderman in particular. The main concern raised was over the proposal for an amortization period. Uh, what was proposed is that existing fences would be required to be removed unilaterally 10 years after the date of adoption of the code amendment. Uh, the council was uncomfortable with that. Uh, they recognized that existing fences uh, were the result of investments of property owners. Um, so in response to that, we did amend the language. There is no longer an amortization period. Um, and so long as fences remain in good condition, uh, are not found to impede water flow, um, and a couple other criteria is detailed on page two of your staff report, fences would be able to remain um, until essentially they, they fell down. So existing fences would not need to be removed unless they were in disrepair, um, caused a safety issue, impeded drainage, or the ownership of the property changed. <clears throat> Uh, so that amortization provision has been struck from the code language as presented. The second question raised was whether, in fact, there should be an opportunity for a variance, uh, even though there would be a prohibition 
of fences in ravines and on bluffs. The code language as written in January and as presented to you today does allow for a property owner to request a variance. Uh, and this is consistent with virtually every other provision in the code. Uh, the zoning board hears those kinds of requests for variances, most often with respect to variance from a required setback from a property line. <clears throat> Um, from the staff's perspective, we believe that the variance process works very well. It allows property owners who meet certain criteria, who have unique circumstances, to come forward through a public process, make their case, and then the decision lies with the zoning board and ultimately the city council as to whether a variance should be granted or not. Um, I think a, a past example of a case where uh, a variance to allow a fence in a ravine assuming these provisions had already been effect, in effect, um, might have been made, was a case where an owner undertook a, a very large, very significant restoration of a ravine that spanned several properties um, that worked closely with the Army Corps of Engineers that assured that the slopes were returned to a 22 degree stable condition uh, extensive revegetation with appropriate species and in that case there was one area of the ravine that was terraced and what was proposed as part of that overall ravine restoration plan was a four foot I believe dark green chain link fence for a short span that might have been an example of a situation where that owner might have gone to the zoning board and said as part of this overall pro project uh, there's a certain terraced area that would be supported by the erection of this fence. So just to give you an example of how a variance might work. Um, so again, staff does recommend that the opportunity for variance um, really is very consistent with the way the code operates and we believe that a strong process is in place to allow um, the variance to be properly judged. If you choose to do so, it be appropriate after hearing public testimony to reconsider the amendment and then to again forward a recommendation to the city council on this matter i'd be happy to answer any questions questions of uh... <clears throat> yes uh thank you chairman <clears throat> kathy a question for you the amortization concept i know it was struck specifically from um city council came back to us is that concept in use in the city for any other items that you can think of? I can't think of where we've used it in Lake Forest. I have worked in other communities where it has been used and the city attorney uh, certainly verified for us that it, it is a tool that has been supported by the courts. The length of time needs to be reasonable. But no, I, I cannot think of an instance where we've used that in Lake Forest. So this would be consistent with other things we've done if we don't include it? Yes. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, I have a question. Um, Kathy, the, the, the only issue that struck out to me was, uh, or that stuck out to me was the question around um, change of ownership and if a wall or a fence or whatever structure would be maintained in proper condition based on the other um, requirements because of the change of ownership the city would then go in and require people to tear that down or would they have to come into it for a variance or would they be non-conforming at closing the way this is written right now the amortization was taken out the change of ownership wasn't what that would mean would be prior to the issuance of a transfer stamp that the fence, in, in this case it applies to fences only, not to walls, the fence okay. would need to be removed before the issuance of a transfer stamp or a variance could be requested. Okay, so they'd have to go through the variance process. Correct. Okay. And they would be notified of them as part of a title requirement? How, how would that be noticed? That would have to be something that uh, we would identify as, as through a home inspection prior to the sale of a home, prior to the issuance of a transfer stamp, uh, the realtors notify the city. There are several things that happen. We do a home inspection uh, to assess whether there is any cross connection between sanitary and storm sewer. If there is, that needs to be fixed. Uh, if a property was on a ravine or a bluff, there would be an inspection for a fence. And then final water bills, there, there are a number of other 
things that need to be need to happen. So that would happen as part of that pre transfer stamp application process. Thank you. Uh, Kathy, uh, another question on the variance process. Uh, as, as I read the proposed language, the Zoning Board of Appeals may consider requests for variances. Uh, would they also consider the uh, design and construction, uh, the material? Would they refer it to the, could they refer it to the Building Review Board? Or should the Building Review Board be included somewhere in language? <coughs> I think we, also, we always want to be careful not to make the process too burdensome. The Zoning Board could absolutely refer anything to the Building Review Board or Historic Preservation Commission if it's in the district. But in the criteria that are rec recommended, um, it does speak generally to the appearance of the fence. It talks about a fence, and this actually was language that the Plan Commission modified in January. It speaks to the fact that the fence is dark, is excuse me, black or dark green, open chain link, or a similar minimally site obscuring material. Perhaps a, a split rail fence might be proposed by someone and might be found by the zoning board to fit that criteria. Um, certainly with respect to the construction method, some of the criteria require a slope stability assessment. So we'd, we'd wanna look at that up front to make sure the particular area where the fence is proposed uh, isn't an area where there have been slides in the past. Um, so that information would be provided to the zoning board and based on these criteria could all be considered and weighed by them. Including the design mm -hmm. type of material. Correct, based on that criteria. Okay. And then uh, finally, uh, section 5A says pro, uh, fences are not permitted on slopes beyond ravine or bluff edges as defined in section 2 of this chapter. Um, could you maybe give us a little idea of what that definition is? Yes. Um, bluff edges and ravine edges are defined, and I, I thought it was in there, but maybe it's not, um, defined as the, the ravine or bluff side of the tableland at which the slope of the land first begins to exceed 10%. So anything behind that, it would be permissible to build a fence? Yes, so the, the, the steep slope ordinance um, that's currently in the code requires a much greater setback. Uh, the steep slope uh, ordinance requires 20-foot setback from ravines from the point at which a 22-degree angle first intersects the tableland. Um, so that's a, a pretty big, big expanse, a 20-foot setback. From bluffs, that setback is 75 feet. So these fences could be essentially, as the definition says, at the edge or the point at which that tableland first begins to make that sharper slope. So this does not prohibit fences so long as they're within the setback. Is that correct or am I misunderstanding? It does not prohibit fences in the steep slope setback. It prohibits fences more specifically on the slopes. Construction of a garage, for instance, is, um, is prohibited not just at the edge of the ravine or bluff, but much further back. If you are building a structure, that needs to start 20 feet back or 75 feet back, depending on whether you're dealing with a ravine or bluff. Okay, thank you. Kathy, uh, <clears throat> I have some questions <clears throat> about section, proposed section 5C2, where it provides, it, it says the fence <clears throat> compliance shall be determined at the sole discretion of the city if the fence is maintained in good repair in an upright position. Repairs shall not include or permit excavation or the setting of new posts on the slope of the ravine or bluff. What if there was a bad windstorm or flooding or something occurred whereby, I'm wondering, does this mean that the property owner may not rebuild that fence or could they come back let me ask that first question and then I have a subset question. If there was a severe wind, 
and the fence portion of the fence was knocked over based on staff's interpretation of this the the fence itself could be repaired so long as uh, new excavation was not required to set new poles if the entire fence came down the posts were broken off essentially a new fence had to be built this provision would not allow a new fence to be built so it could be repaired and certainly there is always that interpretation um, but also keep in mind that any interpretation of the code made by city staff is appealable so if, for instance staff went out um, received a complaint uh, a portion of a fence was was washed out and staff made an interpretation that um, it was obstructing stormwater drainage and needed to come down that decision that staff decision could be appealed to the zoning board of appeals okay so every decision every interpretation is is appealable and is never final what if the repair of the fence merely involved digging of the post holes, date the existing post holes deeper and to have a longer post, would that be precluded? As this is written, it, it, it really states that no further excavation could occur. It, of any type? Correct. It, okay. It's really the, the excavation that if, if there is going to be excavation on the bluff that we really should be looking, we should be requiring steep slope analysis we should be looking at erosion that may have occurred in the past so the way this is written it's intended that any new excavation would not be permitted but if the the upper part the upright part of the fence could be repaired and and replaced so long as um, okay. e even if a post needed to be replaced and no further excavation was needed this would permit that as well okay. but not further digging on the bluff or a ravine unless it actually went through a process um, much as if someone requests a, a variance from the steep slope ordinance if someone wants to there are many uh, non-conforming structures within the steep slope and sometimes some work may need to be done on those and we do work with owners to come forward and um, make sure that they've done proper studies so that their property isn't harmed or their neighbor's property isn't harmed so there is a process for looking at that. Thank you. Any further questions of Kathy, staff? Okay, <clears throat> we're at the point of uh, public testimony. Uh, let me ask, is there anyone here who wishes to testify uh, during the public hearing portion of this? Uh, okay, let's uh, swear you in, please stand. Please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly declare and affirm that the testimony that you are about to give or have previously given is true and correct to your best of your knowledge? Thank you. At this point, I would uh, call upon uh, whoever would like to come first, and I would ask that uh, you give us your name and your address before you begin your testimony, please. Yes. <laughs> actually gives the staff the tools they need to work with um, the issues at hand and to minimize fences and ravines and bluffs, but also while letting homeowners come forward, ask for a fence, and if you get one, <coughs> so long as several, as it, in my opinion, several reasonable conditions are met. Um, that said, uh, I'd like to submit two photos for your consideration. Maybe a little bit more. 
Ah, sorry. I wondered whether I was on. Uh, one is of a retaining wall, and the other is of a picket fence right along the beach. Um, so my question is, obviously a retaining wall is not a fence, but retaining walls have become quite an issue as, as I um, travel around, take a look around town, especially those on bluffs and ravines. And um, is a picket fence in that case, for example, is would you consider that minimally sight obscuring and it, would that be something that um, would pass the staff's tests? Um, so I submit that many of these retaining walls, which are often railroad ties, may need to be examined in more detail as we go forward and, and, and it should not at this time impact your consideration of this proposal, but, um, but I'd like to see the staff take a look at this as we go forward. Um, and regarding any fences in ravines or bluffs, often proper, the first thing property owners I think think of is we need a fence. And I would like the education um, uh, program of the city to, to um, uh, work with homeowners on this issue a lot more, um, um, uh, more vigorously because I would like homeowners to think, well, maybe we don't need a fence. Maybe we should call a landscape designer or an ecologist because I would submit to you that we can create a, a very dense, very thick thicket of shrubbery, junipers, witch hazels, things that are much more um, called for in a ravine or a bluff situation and would be impossible for anybody to penetrate. So we would get we would get what we need and what the homeowner wants in privacy, but we would get the ecology that we're trying so desperately to get so that we don't have this kind of erosion on our beaches and our bluffs and our ravines. So thank you for your consideration. I urge you to go forward. Good evening. Um, good evening. My name is Devin Dallaire, and I live at 261 Bluffs Edge Drive in Lake Forest with my wife Robin and my daughter Sarah. Um, as a resident of Lake Forest, an owner of a ravine property, and an owner of a soon-to-be non-conforming fence in the ravines, um, I strongly oppose the retroactive portion of the proposed modification to the city's fence ordinance. And while I think the current retroactive language improves upon the original version, by not including an explicit amortization period. However, by forcing property owners to remove fencing upon the sale of that property, um, it will still impose a significant economic burden on me whenever I choose to sell my property. Um, one, I'll have to pay to have my fence removed. Two, I'll have to pay to have a pool fence installed since I am an owner of a pool. And three, my property will suffer you know, from diminution of value from not being fully fenced. Given these costs, I, I think it is only reasonable to ask what exactly the net benefits are to the communi community of forcing me to remove my fence at the time of sale. Um, first, I think there have been some con a lot of concern and speculation that my fence is potentially harmful to the stability of the ravine um, and could possibly impede stormwater drainage. However, when we constructed our house, Last year, we had numerous surveys and engineering reports conducted, none of which showed any such adverse impact. Furthermore, since then, I've not been presented with one shred of scientific evidence or testimony that does. Um, second, there have been some claims that somehow my fence has created a safety hazard. Um, this argument that's being, uh, the, the argument being placed, uh, being, being that by placing the fence adjacent to the walking path, I've narrowed the path by several inches and therefore made it more treacherous to the people who use it to access the lake. Um, and I guess my comment is as follows. If anyone truly feels that the walking path is too dangerous to use, they should simply stop using it. The fact is the portion of the path which the fence is adjacent to is located 100% on private property and contains no easements whatsoever. Nobody has any rights, title, or interest in that piece of property except me and my family. And to the 20, approximately 20 households in Bluffs Edge subdivision who do in fact have beach access rights through the ravine, if they, felt that the path, if they feel that the path is too dangerous, 
I would also encourage them to stop using it. Instead, I would encourage them to use the actual dedicated easement that was deeded to them, which happens to be a 20-foot strip of land located at the base of the ravine, which in fact neither overlaps nor intersects my path at all. So what then is the benefit from removing my fence? Well, in my opinion, I think the most obvious and honest answer is aesthetics. For my neighbors and people walking along the footbridge, I can certainly understand why some of them would prefer to have an un unobstructed view of the ravine versus a view of my fence. Uh, I too would prefer to look out my windows and see nothing but woods, ravines, and wildlife, but, but I don't. And in fact, you know, neither do the majority of the people who choose to live in Lake Forest. When I constructed my fence, I, I tried to be considerate of my neighbors by specifically not fencing in the path. Um, and in fact, I tried extremely hard to locate the fence as far off the path as possible without significantly impacting existing vegetation. I did this because I felt it was the neighborly thing to do. Uh, in return, I would have expected those who benefited from using the path to be reasonably accommodating and respectful of my property rights. I understand that all good zoning regulations aim to balance or strike a balance between individual rights and the public good. Uh, and while I think it, it can be argued that an ordinance that restricts future fencing in the ravines can be justified on that basis, I think it's difficult to see how a retroactive ordinance that essentially targets my property while yielding a limited benefit to a small number of people achieves that goal. I respectfully request that you eliminate the retroactive portion of the proposed amendment that requires removal of fencing upon the change of ownership. Thank you. Good evening, uh, Mark Ostwick. I live here in Lake Forest. I'm really here to speak upon, um, I didn't make the January meeting, I wasn't aware of it, but it really has to do with his fence and uh, not to pick on him, but I'm really concerned about that fence in general. You know, does it meet the current setbacks? Does it meet the height requirements? It seems like it's high. And really, what was the purpose of the fence? Security, because I've never seen a ravine in Lake Forest using that particular beach in 37 years. I've never seen a ravine so violated. And I think before you make any decision, you should go down there and look at it. It's an eyesore, it's terrible. Uh, I've never seen such an outcry in the community about a particular fence and living here my whole life. And I think you should try and walk down that path and see how dangerous it is. So I don't think uh, the retroactive part is an issue. I think that fence should be torn down. And I think it doesn't comply with city variances height or otherwise, safety or otherwise, Army Corps engineer or otherwise. Um, I don't know what the purpose is. Security, it can't be security because the whole west side of his property is open. You can walk right in. So I don't know when he talks about, and I don't mean to pick on you, about he likes ravines and views and everything else. If you do, why did you put up a fence like that? It is unbelievably ugly, and it creates lots of hazards, safety and otherwise. So. I th besides retroactively, I think it should be torn down. I think the city should, who approved it? Was there a variance? Did the city approve it? Because I don't think it complies to many city ordinances already. So those are issues that I like to see addressed. And I would say to the committee, please walk down there and see how ugly it is and see what a safety hazard is and it doesn't fit. I've never seen a ravine in Lake Forest so violated. <clears throat> so that's just heartfelt, sorry I was losing my voice, but it's passionate and I think there's 100 people I've talked to in Lake Forest who feel just as passionate as I do. And not to pick on this gentleman, your house is your house, but I don't get the reason for that fence at all. And nor does many, many hundreds of people in Lake Forest. Please go see it. It'll, it'll influence your decision immensely. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Don Zardani. I live at 1141 Gavin Court currently. Uh, I was the contractor and also a neighbor to um, the prop property that we're discussing this evening. Uh, to address the issue from the last gentleman who just spoke, uh, it was uh, went through the proper procedure. There was a permit issued. Uh, there was engineering. Uh, it, it satisfies code for the uh, height restriction. Uh, 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 
fence. I don't even think a, a maximum of seven feet in town on a stockade fence. Uh, everything was gone through the building review board and a permit was issued. So that, that's not the issue here. The issue here is uh, property rights. Somebody purchases a property, uh, they follow the guidelines of what the city and the building review board have to offer and uh, my client and, and my neighbor followed that. Now some, you know, the rest of the community, if there's a hundred or maybe there's a thousand people in the community that we live in, dislike that property because of the fence, that's their private property. Uh, people have passed through, there's comments that people have gone down to the beach numerous times, they've trespassed. I think everyone forgets that point, that the Del Airs own the property, they own into the ravine, they own into the water, the creek that goes through there. They intentionally set the fence back off of that path to allow certain individuals to walk through. Um, living on the lake, there's nothing but trouble. People coming through your backyard, trespassing, coming up, walking through the back, breaking into homes on that street numerous times, victim numerous times, kids parking cars on there on a Sunday afternoon, going down to the beach where cars had to be towed off numerous times, people stealing uh, uh, gardening, uh, bluestone, anything possible because if a house is vacant, I think there's a point where somebody ha deserves the right to protect their property and if they have a dog, if they have a pool, um, you, sh you should allow it. So, you know, uh, enough with enough. There's enough people crying in this town about other things. You should also start looking at, if you're going to, you know, stereotype somebody on a fence, you should start looking at people that don't restore their uh, bluffs and the erosion problem that's so bad that creates neighbors when they buy property, it costs them, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in order to restore because they're losing 10, 20 feet uh, each year on a bluff. I think you sh that, that's something you should spend your time in, and uh, um, spend more research on than, than something of a you know, as a fence, you know, it, it, it's, it's got to end, you know, it, it gets personal for most people and uh, they start, you know, casting stones on the other side of the ravine. So thank you for your time. Wait a minute. Point of order here. Point of order. We're still on the public hearing portion. If, if I'm still available, I can comment. Right. I can address that. Uh, I did not sell the property. I, I constructed the resident for them, okay, contractor. I live next door. We do have a stockade fence along two sides because there's a pool uh, to satisfy pool code. If you can, you know, Kathy could, I'm sure, comment on that. You, you have to have a fence. Also, you have to have uh, closures that automatically close. Uh, also, for the instance with the Delairs, they, they have dogs. They have three dogs. So. You have a, a combination of satisfying for a pool, uh, satisfying their needs for protection for the dogs to run wild through the ravines, which I believe that would probably be a nuisance and you, you need to have a leash in this town as well. And um, also for privacy. Sir, sir, this, I'm sorry. Th this is not for debate. Okay. Uh, I'm just trying to get information. No, I understand. The property is fully enclosed uh, from, from the side setbacks. Uh, to uh, you know, along the uh, eastern property line on the shoreline that's set back into the uh, woods, so it's not offensive if there were people trespassing on the beach, which they should not, because that's a private beach. Uh, to the uh, to the south, that adjoins the uh, neighbor at 277's property, which uh, was my former ho former home, and that satisfies uh, a pool. As code requires, you have to have your own fence, so there's two fences uh, abutting each other, and then it returns back into the dwelling. Uh, going to the uh, north, the uh, fence will uh, dissect into uh, the, uh, along the walking path, uh, per se. So it's fully enclosed. I'm okay. <coughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> uh, opportunity for cross-examination. Uh, do we need to do that? At the, okay. <clears throat> um, next item is staff response to public task testimony. Kathy? Uh, just a couple points to clarify. Um, as I mentioned, staff has uh, in the past tried to work with property owners. Uh, 
who live on ravines or bluffs and uh, to balance their need for security, privacy, aesthetic issues, and, and tried to work with people on appropriate fences. Um, through the years, various sections of our codes, we've, we've realized that they're not uh, sufficient to address current issues or their gaps. And so the, the fence that exists today was approved through the permitting process. Um, we did have discussions. I, we did work with the city attorney. We, we tried to um, achieve a situation that would mitigate the impacts. Um, but in, in the end, um, we, we did as much as we could. Um, and as I said, as a result, there were a number of contacts. And this hearing tonight, importantly, is not about that fence. It, it's really that, that initiated this discussion. Um, so I don't want to respond to all the specifics about that fence. Um, this wasn't the only fence that there were concerns about. There have been other recent fence that raised similar concerns. And it just got to the point where there were enough concerns that it was an issue that needed to be addressed one way or another. So that's why this matter is before you. Um, with respect to uh, the ownership, the removal upon change of ownership provision, um, based on the council's discussion, staff tried to, worked with the city attorney and, and tried to balance uh, the private property, uh, owner's investment in the property with the interest interest in at some point seeing some of these fences come down. So whether that uh, requirement for removal at the time of ownership uh, goes too far or not far enough, I, I think that's a discussion for the plan commission. Okay. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Uh, <clears throat> are there uh, any uh, final questions from commissioners to, uh, to Kathy before we discuss? Um, I would just like to ask you, Kathy, um, what we are specifically being asked to consider here this evening. I, as, as, from, from what I understand, uh, City Council has asked the Plan Commission to refine its recommendation with respect to this ordinance on essentially three key aspects. First being uh, whether there should be an ordinance prohibiting fences on slopes beyond ravines or bluff edges at, at all. Uh, secondly, should a variance uh, to the general prohibition of such fences be included as a provision in the ordinance? And then finally, uh, should the code include a provision that requires removal of fencing either at a change of ownership subject to a potential variance or after an amortization period of some determined length. Um, is, 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 are those the three essential issues we're being asked to consider? Or? I have a final question, Kathy. As written, uh, Mr. Dallaire testified to the f that the provision 5C3 would require removal of the fence upon transfer of the property. Is, is that interpretation correct? Yes, the way it is written, um is that before, and the way it would be practically implemented is before a transfer stamp was issued, um, the removal of the fence would need to occur 
again, at the same time as other items that might need to be addressed at the house. But yes, the way it's written, that is how it would be, is interpreted. Did the council consider the possibility, or at least consider a variance procedure on that last point? In other words, at the time upon transfer, if the thing was in still good condition and uh, could, as written now, it does not permit a variance procedure for that point. Am I correct? As written now, I believe it would allow the property owner to, owner to come back through the variance procedure, but we certainly could add that language to be more specific that that's an option prior to the sale of the property. And the council didn't discuss it because they only raised sure. concerns and directed it back to you. Okay. Because as, as I read it, it does not include a variance procedure so that if, if the commission wanted to add a variance procedure, then we may wish to add <clears throat> language to clarify that. Are we going to flow? Uh, can we open for discussion now at this point? I or? think we're ready to move to that point. Okay, because that's, that's really my critical point. I didn't mean to, that's to okay, jump in. That for me is the critical point here. I think practically um, it's a logistical nightmare to try to assume that a, on a sale uh, of a transaction of property where you come in for stamps two or three days before closing that you're going to then fig find out or realize that you've got a fence that needs to be taken down so then you're going to go through the variance process first of all secondly i think the the testimony that we've heard today is indicative of the fact that we do have a problem right that there's some ambiguity here i think the language that we're trying to get to will avoid these types of issues in the future what's happened in the past i don't think we should really address and so for those reasons i think it would be unfair to current homeowners who have fences that have been permitted and that are, are rightfully there to to more or less punish them when they transfer their property so from my perspective that that provision uh, 5 3 5 c3 should be stricken completely that we shouldn't have a requirement that upon sale or transfer of title that they should be all of a sudden either taken down the fence or be forced to uh, into a variance process that late in the game of a transaction. I just don't think that, that that's correct or fair. So my, my recommendation would be to strike that whole provision. Lloyd or? I would agree. Augie? Well, <clears throat> I, I think the way that, that I'm seeing things, I'd like to keep the amortization out, <clears throat> excuse me, because that's consistent with what we do within the city. There is no other amortization concept applied anywhere else. I would like to keep the variance process in because, again, that's consistent with everything else we do within the city. Um, I don't know that striking it out completely, there, there is, we're trying to write or recommend an ordinance that pertains to a particular individual or small group of individuals that have fences. It, it pertains to them, but we're writing it for the community right. and the community character um, <clears throat> trying to pre preserve. I, I'm, I'm stuck on whether or not to take that out upon sale because there is a process. It's a variance process. There is the ability to be able to keep the fence during a sale. Like Jim has said, when it gets identified late in the sale process, that is a hardship in, in and of itself, you know, because it delays a closing potentially. Um, I'm, I'm not against leaving it in, but maybe it needs to be modified somehow, and I'm not quite sure what that is, because I think there needs to be the, the community taken into account as far as the character of the ravines. I've, I've seen this fence. I went to Walden Bridge, looked to the east. It's very, it's very big, it's very long. It's also very new. And I know in time that's gonna weather. And maybe when the house sells, there's another process to preserve the fence without a full variance. I'm, I'm not quite sure what that is. But I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm trying to balance the character of the ravine 
We've seen letters. We've heard from people who live on the ravine. At the same time, we have an individual that's spent a lot of money, and I can understand his property rights. So I'm, at this moment, I'm a little torn which way to go with that. Yeah. I think to, to bridge <clears throat> the difference here, it seems to me <clears throat> that if we add language to point, keep three in, <clears throat> but put in language to the effect that a variance could be obtained at that point, would that, I would ask the commission, would that bridge our gap? In other words, the statement is, if it remains in the same ownership it exists on the date of passage, unless a variance is obtained to retain the fence. How would that happen in a practical way? I would ask Kathy <clears throat> if that's doable. I think that's what you're asking. Uh, it, it is doable. Certainly, um, we could. Um, in the past, we've, we've sent uh, information or ravine brochures out to all the properties located on a ravine or bluff for different reasons. We could certainly send out a letter that notifies people of these changes and notifies them that of the opportunity to apply for a variance prior to sale to allow a fence to remain. Um, I think from a practical standpoint, it's doable. I, is it um, is it complicated? I think it is a bit complicated. Um, I think it, it just depends which direction you want to go. Yeah. Excuse me, Kathy. Is there any way it could be done on a staff level without going through the entire process? I think if, if a variance is going to be granted, um, variances are granted based on a recommendation and then are actually approved by ordinance of the city council. So for any new fences going forward, there would actually be an ordinance, and many times variances are granted on certain conditions. Uh, the conditions may be that the fence is no taller than four feet or is um, an open chain link fence or, you know, is constructed in a certain way or at a certain time of year. So I don't think, um, well, I know that to, to delegate a variance from the code to staff is, is not something that is legally appropriate. I remain concerned with the practical way in which this would unfold. Um, it'd be all too easy for a homeowner to just sell the house and then the new the buyer is stuck with something he in non conforming. Right. Something non conforming and he didn't know that Well there was we a good would inspect. Um, before we issue a transfer stamp, we there is a process. We do go out to homes every home that sells, and we do an ins inspection to make sure there is no cross-connection between water sewer. Um, and this would be another item that gets inspected. Obviously, it, it would be on the list for properties that are on, that are on ravines or bluffs. Um, and it, it, it's a judgment call. It, it certainly, um, as many of you said, it's in response to the concern about conditions of bluffs and character and long-term effects of fences in the ravines or disrepair they fall into, um, I think that's the basis for putting something in there that requires them to be removed. But from a practical standpoint, from a property owner investment standpoint, um, there are some fences in ravines that have been done very well and that are uh, have minimal visual impact and um, have been located on... Uh, rather than slopes on, on more um, uh, lateral portions of ravines. Um, it's, it's a tough call, and that's why we're throwing it to you. Right, and, and, and I do agree with the comments of, of the rest of the commission with regard to the variance and, and the need. And I think had this ordinance be in place prior to this instance, the homeowner would have done something different and probably uh, been in a situation where there wouldn't be a controversy, but frankly, I don't think it's proper for us to try to correct some wrongs of past mistakes or past errors okay. in the code. And then, and again, in my opinion, it's impractical. It's impractical to say when a stamp was going to be issued that you have to now retain experts you have to go ahead and and get architectural drawings or some sort of plan in place 
and you've got a 60 day period of time before you're going to get before a commission before the, um, the the planning or the zoning commission to get a variance I mean we're not talking about something very simple here as far as a process if it's dilapidated it comes down if it's not in good repair it should come down without question but to in my opinion be punitive on a homeowner that is in currently conforming use or conforming fence I, I just don't think it's right for us to try to force on the transfer that that whole process either to tear down or to have them go through this this dramatic process to correct or to change but do I understand you to say uh, <clears throat> Jim that a variance process would be okay in your mind I think a variance process if you were going to after this this ordinance is passed that there should be a variance process whereby which a homeowner can come in and petition to get a fence installed initially for the first time or a replacement fence for where a fence is dilapidated and they've needed to pull it down because it's unsightly unsafe or what have you based on other provisions of the code so there should be a variance element to the ordinance but for upon a transfer of sale that just seems to me to to again be unfair impractical and and somewhat punitive so that's the clarity that from my perspective it is not a variance around transfer but where there's a transfer if it's conforming if it's in proper condition it goes as if my garage were in the side yard setback I'm not forced to tear that down even if it may be unsightly but if it's in the side yard um, it's grandfathered in and I can transfer the property I can either buy the property or sell the property without tearing that garage down mm -hmm. that's how I see this provision that's how I see this ordinance reading and that's how I believe it should read I, I agree with that logic I was thinking along the same lines that again staying consistent with the processes if there's a variance granted for a building upon sale of the building nothing changes it's sold as is because it went through a process so it didn't have to resort back to the initial code requirements I, I think or if it was grandfathered in prior right. to that right. I think we're ready for a motion and then uh, let, let, let's um, uh, get a actually, motion on a, the a table couple, and then we can debate it a couple other comments though po possibly uh, chairman if that's okay sure. um, if we're still in discussion on, on page three we talk about language now proposed in summary allows fences to remain and it gives three conditions and I'd like to add the fourth one and that is a permit was lawfully obtained when the fence went in because are there any fences Kathy right now that may have been constructed without a permit that should come down in other words they won't be protected by this ordinance you know what I'm saying I, I am sure there are fences that were erected without permits um, so we could certainly add that yeah they, they shouldn't just because we're passing a detailed ordinance they shouldn't be protected because they were unlawfully built true but then how do you define how do you clarify which fences were built before there was a permit requirement and has those always, that were built afterwards yeah, has there and, always been a permit I, I think uh, there permits are required for fences today right I understand that but <clears throat> a lot of homes here and a lot of fences are 20 30 40 years old and if maintained properly they're not necessarily unsightly but they may have been in place prior to permit requirement I don't know of any that I off the top of my head but I imagine that there probably are the the requirement for permits has been in place for decades um, so I you know again at your discretion it it could be added it it would not be something it would be um, based on this ordinance the city is not going to go out and do a wholesale survey of every fence and every ravine and on every bluff certainly if problems arise what this does is give us a framework if there's a fence that's uh, falling into the ravine if there is um, a site where erosion has occurred and it's clear that it involves the location of the fence that's where we're going to be involved um, and so those are the cases where we might go back and look if a, a fence permit was issued but um, fence permits were required um, long before we were all born really yes <laughs> oh well, I can live with that then 
Yeah, another, another item, if, if it's okay, in uh, where we talked about the five elements of the variance criteria, 5B, and then it has five items. Yes. It talks about, you know, the, the things that need to be considered. Should another thing, and maybe it's inherent in, in just the variance process, but why not having the fence is a hardship. Any variance would also be evaluated based on the standard criteria in the code for all variances. So these, these speak specifically to fences, but standard variances, standard variance criteria require demonstration that the, the um, property is unique in some aspect, that it, it is not similar to every other property in the zoning district, that there is some kind of a hardship and that that hardship uh, could not have been created either by the existing property owner or any prior property owner. Um, and perhaps Commissioner Culbertson can recite the others, but, but there are those, um, those standard conditions that would also be evaluated by the zoning board. Thank you. Okay. Is there someone who would like to make a motion? I'll make a motion. I'll make a motion that the uh, the commission approve the ordinance um, proposed uh, to section five with the amendment that section five point C three be deleted in its current fashion, and the provision that reads um, fences that at their time of installation did not have approved permits should be should would be in violation and should be um, torn down or something along those lines. Does that get where you're yes. where you're talking about? Not, not protected by the new ordinance. Not protected by this ordinance. Correct. Right. So right. I think that's good, Jim. Thank so you. <clears throat> to clarify, uh, Jim, you would strike three as currently written. Correct. And substituted for that what you just described as applying only to those fences that were that that did not have a proper permit when installed okay so if they violated the code then they've gotten away from it but they they would not be protected I, and i think the way this is written fences located on slopes etc may remain maybe item three should be <coughs> if a proper permit was obtained I can at the time of installation right right and we will actually review the exact language with the city attorney right but we'll cover your point and then, okay. yeah that's what you were looking for thank you <laughs> okay do I have a second to that motion second further discussion seeing none all those in favor say aye aye, aye. Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. <clears throat> the next item is uh, item number four, which uh, public hearing in action and consideration of amendments to the zoning code to permit a farmer's market as a seasonal use in the B4 Preservation Business District. Presented by Kathy. Thank you, Chairman Lay, members of the commission. Uh, two years ago, the city council approved a pilot project through a temporary special use permit to allow a farmer's market to operate and that first year it was behind City Hall. Um, that market was operated out of the city manager's office by the economic development coordinator who I invited, but she actually had a conflict tonight, so she was un unable to come forward. After that first year, uh, city staff from various departments, um, City Hall, police, fire, public works, uh, parks, and community development met, evaluated the uh, the uh, operations of the market 
identified where there were some snags, identified some opportunities for improvement. And the second year, we came back before the city council for approval of a one-year farmer's market, uh, which last year was actually moved to the train station to respond to some input we received. Um, again, we did an evaluation after that year, received input from vendors, residents, the city council, um, very, staff from various departments, um, and it was felt that, that that really is a good event for the community. And so to recognize that event on an ongoing basis, we are proposing that a farmer's market be added to the zoning code as a permitted use in the B4 district, which is the district that covers the very core area of the city. Um, in the language proposed, uh, which is in, in your staff memo, um, there are laid out, uh, what is laid out as a process for administra administrative approval, uh, list a number of items that would be required uh, such as a circulation plan, uh, site plan showing where vendors would be located. We would review that process, again, using staff from various departments to assure that appropriate emergency access is provided, appropriate circulation routes. Um, we would limit the number of vendors. We would allow the market to operate during certain months, uh, once a week for up to six hours a day. Um, so we would have an operational plan that we would have in place, but we would be able to approve it administratively because it would be now a permitted use in the B4 zoning district. So you do have a recommendation for um, code language that would be added, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Questions for Kathy? Kathy, in, <clears throat> as far as you know, in the time that there's been a farmer's market in Lake Forest, have you gotten any uh, complaints from the retailers about taking up parking or anything like that? We haven't. Not, not to my knowledge. In fact, I think from many re retailers, we received support for the activity because it gave people a reason to come down. Um, but we, I think the complaints we got were suggestions. I, I think people really encouraged us to look at moving into the train station. And I think with the addition of Pasquazes, on the west side of the tracks that that's become a very vital area. But no, I, from the retailers, we really haven't received any, any complaints that I'm aware of. Just one other quick question. Um, do we require that the non-for-profit group that runs the market provide us with any guidelines in terms of like what they're selling, what more importantly, what they're not selling, not, you know, so on and so forth. So there's like some rules that we say, okay, you can get a permit, and we and we will allow the permit, but it's based on guidelines that you're providing us, and you know, picking up litter, things like that. Our expectation is that the city is going to continue to be the non-for-profit who who runs this. Um, I think we wrote it a, a little more open, recognizing, for instance, that maybe the college would want to take it over. Um, what we have provided in the language is that what is sold. Um, is locally grown produce, locally produced products. So we've tried to um, put some parameters around there uh, without being too specific. Um, we do uh, ask that they submit an operational plan that, that talks about who's going to be in charge and certainly picking up litter as part of that. There is an actual agreement that each of the vendors are asked to sign. That agreement was developed the first year, modified the second year by the city council. That deals with liability issues and responsibilities. So that piece is in place as a, essentially a contract between the vendor and the city. Thank you. A, a couple quick, yeah, a couple quick questions. Um, number one was uh, the requirement that it be located in a surface parking lot. So if there were enough energy or enough uh, excitement about this to close off, say, Western, would that take a special permit? Would that be some sort of different process or would that be covered here? That would not be covered here. That would, anytime a public street is closed, that requires a special request. Um, it doesn't mean that three years from now, if the city council decided every Saturday morning we want to close Western Avenue down, that could certainly be a modification to sure. this, but um, closing a public, 
public street is a separate process. Sure. And, and this and wouldn't allow that. And how does that work now? Um, to request a street obstruction permit, um, that's submitted. Uh, insurance issues are looked at. Police and fire are brought in. Um, there's a whole operational plan. For instance, if a street is closed for a special event, um, such as when we had the 150th celebration, um, I think anytime those be lighting, we do it every, yeah, you know, right. Year, and right. and the city, when the city does events, obviously, the city council is authorizing those kind of events. But there have been times when a a private business owner has requested closure of a portion of a street. So there is a a process for that and um, reimbursement to the city for barricades or anything that might need to happen but but this doesn't involve closing a public street right no i understand that but this just makes it easier to to hold the farmer's market on a regular basis as opposed to having to go through that whole process on a regular basis to get a special permit or what have you yes it, it simply streamlines the process and um the the code language was developed based on the fact that we had a couple pilot pilot years to help us shape what this would look like. Great, thank you. What are the current hours of operation for the farmer's market? Um, I believe last year the market opened at eight, the year before it opened at seven, and that wasn't a real productive hour. And I believe the last year the market closed at 12 and they had vacated the site by one. The language here says uh, for a period not to exceed six hours. Um, would it make any sense to include uh, beginning not earlier than and not going later than? In Could certainly do that. Time? It's unlikely, but I wouldn't want to see a farmer's market start at 5 p.m. and go till 11 p.m. or something like that. And maybe limiting the starting hour is is more important than the later hour if if they felt that a more productive period was to open the market at 10 and right. i'm not sure going into the afternoon um so that certainly is at the commission's discretion yeah <clears throat> one quick question kathy <clears throat> two things operating together it says it <clears throat> can operate for six hours and then the next item says no more than 30 vendors at one time. What if somebody wanted to just be there for three hours? Would that mean more than 30 if, let's say there was one spot that uh, two vendors agreed to share at three in three hours? It's a small item, but The way it's written, it probably would allow that change out okay. if someone wanted to share a, okay. a space for three and two hours. Um, 30, like 30 vendors is, is, was probably a, a little um, optimistic that we could get 30 vendors. So, okay. All right. Very good. Okay. Uh, any final questions for? Uh, Maybe just one, and I think I know the answer, but I'll ask it anyway. By being the promoter of the event, how are we liable for any sales tax? Is sales tax applicable in a farmer's market situation? I don't know. I'm just asking. I, I don't want to be in a position that we promoted an event, a bunch of things were sold, and their sales tax. I don't tax know are. the answer to that. I do know that the city attorney if, if uh, worked we, closely with the economic development <coughs> coordinator on the agreement, but I. I can't answer that. Okay, maybe we could just ask. Fish. Generally Thank speaking, you. <clears throat> you know, Mike, food isn't taxed uh, unless some food product. Uh, I can't think of one at the jam, moment. Jam, jam, maybe. Well, or honey. Honey. So, but generally speaking, that's the responsibility of the seller. If they're selling a taxable product, and it is. Uh, ongoing sale in other words occasional sales are exempt generally speaking so i would think this would be the responsibility of the vendor if they are selling a taxable product that onus is on the vendor to collect and remit the tax 
can't get transferred to us. You know. The only I do have one quick comment. It seems maybe nitpicky or silly, but should we perhaps limit the uh, the products being sold to legal products, legal locally grown products or produce? Just a thought. How about if I pose that question to the city attorney? Yeah. I'll, I'll note that you raised the question, and if appropriate, we'll insert the that word. Right. Weren't thinking of cannabis, were you? Well, it could be tobacco. <laughs> I want to prohibit it, that's for sure. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, commission discussion and comment. Do you want to limit the hours specifically from, say, 7 a.m. to... 5 p.m. Um, that sounds fine to me. Mm -hmm. Just so we know when it sure. that yeah. six hours would end. Yeah. Or it has to be within that within that, that range. Yeah. yeah. Of seven to five. Seven to six. Well, I threw that out. I, is, is that re, is that a reasonable time frame, Kathy, relative to current experience? Are you thinking um, the hours of the market, or are you including setup no. hours in that seven to five? Well, that's another aspect. Um, they, it does provide for an operational plan be submitted with respect to setup, so I think that can be considered perhaps at the staff level, unless we as a commission want to say you can't begin setup prior to four, you know, 5 a.m. or 6 a.m. or something like that. I, I don't know. It defines it. It says uh, may operate no more than one day per week for a period of not to exceed six hours. And then if we just add at the tail end of that between the hours of 7 a.m. and 5 p.m., I think we're fine because then it only talks about when they're operating, meaning selling goods, right? Right. So setup would be separate from that unless we want to try to. And setup up. would be part of an operational plan that would have to be submitted. Is that correct? Correct. So the, the presumably staff wouldn't encourage setups beginning at 2 a.m. or something like that that would be disruptive. No, to the we community. wouldn't encourage that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so 7 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay. Yeah. Well, we want to make a motion uh, adopting the recommendation of staff and then with that uh, amendment? So moved. Okay. okay. It's been mo moved and seconded that the... Uh, Staff recommendation be adopted with the change that language be added, uh, providing the hours of operation, including setup, would be between 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. Uh, I'm not sure it was including setup. No, no. it was not. No, oh, okay. So. I take, take okay. hours of operation. Hours of, okay. Sorry. And who seconded that? I said. You did. Thank you. And that amendment goes in section 2B. Correct. Right. Okay. Are you ready for the question? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carries unanimously. Okay. Um, item number five is a public hearing and action on. Uh, Consideration of amendments to the zoning code pertaining to the length of terms for members of the Zoning Board of Appeals. Kathy? Thank you, Chairman Lay. Uh, currently, the terms for the Zoning Board of Appeals are five years, one five-year term. Um, that's different than the terms for the Building Review Board, Historic Preservation Commission, and Plan Commission, all of which are two-year terms with a maximum of three two-year terms uh, being served. Um, at the request of the caucus, we did discuss this item with the city attorney. And the history of that five-year term comes from the state statutes. Um, a number of years ago, the city became home rule, which allows uh, the city council to set zoning board of appeals terms uh, to whatever they'd, they'd like. Um, the caucus's suggestion was based on a fact, on, simply on the fact that it may be easier to get people to volunteer for a two-year term to start with rather than tell them you're signing up for five, year, five years at the beginning 
and then they have the opportunity to re-up for an additional two years. So it's a, a pretty straightforward uh, amendment to the code and the staff recommendation is to approve the language as suggested. I see there's no, uh, <clears throat> nobody here to, uh, <laughs> to testify a uh, public hearing on this matter. We'll move to uh, questions, uh, further questions. I have one. Kathy, what happens, is there an effective date on this? Uh, uh, really, I'm asking, are we grandfathering in the current commissioners and this will take effect with new appointments as a, beyond the effective date of the change? Yes, that's exactly what will happen. Okay. Do we need to specify that? That was my question as well. What happens to the current board members? Is that a matter, <laughs> what you just said, is that a, a general legal construct that? Uh... Um, again, I'd, I'd be happy to raise that question with the city attorney. Um, we, we worked through this language and that wasn't raised, but I think that's a good question. Okay. But I would note that Commissioner Culbertson is not getting out of his five-year term. <laughs> <laughs> just I didn't know it was a five-year term to begin with. <laughs> with that, can I make a motion? Sure. I motion that we uh, uh, recommend approval of the language as it stands with the clarification from legal counsel as to uh, language clarifying for existing uh, board members. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Commissioner Ziccarelli. Is there a further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carries unanimously. Uh, num <clears throat> next item is public testimony on non-agenda items. I see no public here at this point, uh, so uh, we can uh, move on to uh, item number seven, additional information from staff. Uh, nothing further from staff. Um, Commissioner Ziccarelli, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but do you want to just do a, a very brief update on uh, Commissioner Ziccarelli is serving on the hospital advisory committee and i don't know if you would just want to comment on the two meetings that have been held uh sure sure um just to inform everyone that we've had two meetings so far uh it's uh we've, we've met the architect the architects uh, actually there's two architects involved one architect is as he described it designing the building from the outside in the other architect is, is starting at the core of the building in terms of the patient's room and designing the building from the inside out, which I think is very interesting because there'll be a point of interface that they're working together. Uh, we, we had a, a, a very substantial meeting about two weeks ago where an initial site plan was presented. Uh, the committee that, that's been chosen consists of, I want to say, Kathy, nine or ten members. Uh, of various disciplines in their careers, you know, uh, a good cross section, I think. And we were presented with the site plan, uh, had numerous uh, questions, comments. Uh, it's, uh, we, we talked about the Route 41 progress with IDOT, which is moving along. Uh, the site plan that we saw had a building positioned, it had parking positioned, it had detention positioned. So it's, it's starting to form in elements of basically block diagrams and then getting refined. Uh, we, we saw a little bit more than a, a block diagram, but they, they have space allocations, let's call it, on the site for how things are coming together. Uh, I believe our next meeting is next week, I believe, and uh, we'll see more. So uh, it, it's a city has formed a good group of people. It's educational for me in particular to listen to high-profile architects and civil engineers talk about this, uh, as well as, um, you know, the hospital uh, administrator has, has spoke as well as to why things are as they are. So other than that, Kathy, I don't know if you had anything else uh, in particular. No, we have nothing specific at this time, but thank you for doing What's, that. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Is there a time frame by which um, there's planned resolution? There's a time frame for the presentations for sure. Mm -hmm. um, and it escapes me now, Kathy, but 
about the next five to six months, I believe, all the way to the end of the year, I think. I actually think they're more optimistic than that. I, I'm not sure the, the time frame is going to come together, but I think it's possible that uh, a recommendation on, on some piece, whether it's the site plan or, or portions of the site plan, could potentially come to the plan commission as early as sometime this summer. Um, I, I don't think we can tell you definitely how that's going to evolve, if it's going to all come together later rather than sooner. Okay. They are still anticipating occupancy of the, of the replacement hospital on or in or about February 2017. Thank you for that report. Welcome. Very good. Further business has come before the commission? Seeing none, a motion to adjourn would be in order. I so move. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those no, motion carries, we are adjourned.